These days, cards are getting thrown into games everywhere. But of all the card games hitting Steam this year, one of the most interesting applications that I've been most excited for is Science of the Sojourner, a game that simulates the back and forth dynamic of a conversation by matching cards. While most card games are adversarial in nature, Signs of the Sojourner is actually a cooperative game. After all, nobody ever walks away happy from a disagreement, so generally everyone wants to get along. And yet, despite the fact you're ostensibly working together, Signs of the Sojourner still maintains all the same dynamics as something like Hearthstone or Magic the Gathering, and you can still unwittingly get in each other's way as often as not. Signs of the Sojourner features an interesting western setting and a cast of likeable and magnetic characters, but the true magic is in how this game creates such a compelling mechanical analog for a real-world conversation. So before you knee-jerk roll your eyes over yet another card game, let me try and sell you on this one. As always, I'm Alex, and this is First Five, where I ask if games are worth your time, not your money. I played a game for five hours, and I'm gonna tell you if those were five hours well spent. And today we're hitting the caravan trail in Signs of the Sojourner. Before we get too deep into the review, I did receive a free advance review copy of this game, so heads up. Signs of the Sojourner starts with an inheritance. Your mother, world traveler, merchant, and practically a local celebrity has passed on, and you've inherited her job. Now it's your turn to travel down the same roads she did, learn about the marks she left on the world, become a traveler and merchant yourself, and if you're good enough, maybe a local celebrity in your own right. The bulk of Signs of the Sojourner focuses on your efforts to make it as a merchant, and that means that it's primarily a conversational game. Every town you stop at on your circuit through the harsh and unforgiving desert is an opportunity to haggle over products to bring home and sell in your shop, and meet people who knew your mother and could tell you more about her own journeys. But instead of a dialogue wheel, you conduct all these conversations with cards. Every card has these symbols on the left and right, and in order to successfully hold a conversation, you have to link matching symbols together. Fail to chain cards together properly, and the conversation falters, you talk past each other, and everybody goes home unsatisfied. Throw in a few card game-esque abilities, like one that lets you see your conversation partner's hand, or search your deck for a specific card, and you've got the broad strokes of a card game. On its face, it's a simple system, but it turns out that card games are actually a really good analog for conversation, because when playing Signs of the Sojourner, I had to make all the same considerations as in a vastly more complicated trading card game like Magic or Hearthstone. Conversations are often collaborative instead of adversarial, but there's no less hemming and hawing over your cards, trying not only to think about what you have, but what your conversation partner might have in their hand that you'll need to plan for. You need to consider not just the best card to continue the chain from your partner, but also what you're setting up your partner to work with. For example, if your partner's used a lot of cards from one suit, you might want to transition to another before they run entirely dry, and so on. A surprising amount of that interplay mirrors the careful consideration one might put on their own words in a normal conversation, molding them not only to respond to a statement, but also to try and predict and influence what response will come next. But just like another player's closed hand of cards, you might be able to make some general predictions about what someone might say, but you'll never know for sure until they actually say it. In Signs of the Sojourner, you're literally working with an AI that you have very little insight into and zero control over to try and build something together, while just as often obliviously foiling each other in your very attempts to cooperate. And if all of that doesn't reflect the social anxiety of trying to connect with another person for the first time, I don't know what does. Even beyond the basic play of a card game, Signs of the Sojourner also includes some deck-building elements that similarly capture the abstract essence of a conversation shockingly well. Every time you talk to someone, you replace one of your existing cards with a card that your conversation partner used, meaning that as you spend more time in specific areas on the map, you have no choice but to adopt the temperament of the locals. And when you come home again, you return changed. But you also can't be a social chameleon and immediately flip your entire deck to suit the situation. Building a specific deck requires time and for you to attach yourself to specific communities, but it also locks you out of others and makes people with opposing decks almost impossible to complete a conversation with. Like this person, Gull. I swear, she is impossible to reason with. <laughs> deck
Mechs even do an outstanding job representing each individual you talk to. For example, take this Aeneas fellow. He's a foreigner, but an incredibly well-spoken one, and it's reflected in his cards. He's still picking up the language, so he gets a smaller hand to work with, a scant two cards to the usual five, and it's easy to run into a dead end where he just doesn't have the right cards to continue a conversation you start. But despite the language barrier, Aeneas is still an eloquent, crafty fellow, and all of his cards are some of the most complex in the game, which can play with any and every suit, where most characters only use two. And from just those few details, you can extrapolate so much about this person and how they converse. I never managed to successfully complete a single conversation with this guy, but he was still one of my favorite characters in the game, just because of all the brilliant different ways the card system characterized him. And I wish half as much came across through the dialogue itself. To be clear, it's not that the writing is bad, in fact it's quite good and produces several instantly magnetic characters, but there's only so much you can accomplish with six to eight sentences of dialogue, and considering you'll only have three to five conversations with a given character, that's an ambitiously tight space to fit something like an entire character arc inside of. The characters are eminently enjoyable to engage with, and I'd happily go down the caravan route another dozen times to chat with them if the game let me, but it's still a fleeting, shallow connection. And when people start acting like I'm their best friend because I stopped to make small talk three times and major revelations start getting dropped, I just don't have the investment for most of those arcs to land with any impact. The one exception to that was Elias. Elias is your best friend next door, the friendly face you always come home to, and naturally a face that you become increasingly estranged from as your travels change you. When you start the game, the two of you have nigh-identical decks, making any conversation an absolute cakewalk, but your shifting personality, represented by your deck of cards, makes connecting with them increasingly complicated starting as soon as a half hour into the game when you come back from your first trip. All things considered, the plot points themselves aren't anything special. Two kids from a small town, one leaves, the other stays, and when the former comes back, the latter gets that sad look and goes, you've changed, man. But because of how the mechanics reinforced those points, it elevated that straightforward narrative into something I emotionally engaged with. I could feel the frustration of wanting to connect to this person, and it just being harder and harder to do so every time I came back. And I felt the hesitation to give up cards that I knew I would need to keep if I didn't want it to get even harder. That's the power of this card system, that it could take a relatively rote narrative and elevate it to a level where it got a genuine reaction out of me. But on that high note, it's time to wrap things up. So let's ask, what do you get out of five hours with Signs of the Sojourner? I managed to polish this game off in just a little over three, but there's room for replayability here as well. A single run is perfectly satisfying and complete on its own, but you'll have neither the time nor the right cards to complete every storyline in the game, to say nothing of the possibility of a plotline getting cut short because you drew a bum hand and screwed up a conversation. So there will always be something extra to come back to. I think if I somehow find the time to finish a second run, that will probably be enough to satisfy me entirely. And in the meantime, I've really been picking up what Signs of the Sojourner has been putting down. Despite its harsh western setting of frontier towns barely clinging to life, Signs of the Sojourner is an incredibly pleasant game to just exist in. Its mechanics are relatively light, but there's a bottomless well of little details to get lost in, both when creating decks and when marveling over just how well the deck building formula works as a metaphor for conversation and the ways we're changed by our interactions with others. As the newest hot trend in indies, card game mechanics tend to get labeled as just being tacked on fairly often, but in this case, those mechanics are essential to elevating everything else in the game. And while I might not be entirely sold on some of the character arcs, that's more of an issue of format and not one of the characters themselves. As a little market conversations making small talk over wares still made for some fun vignettes. Overall, Signs of the Sojourner is a great little gem and a relaxing way to spend a weekend. If you guys didn't already know, I just launched a Patreon. And with your generous support, I can start doing all kinds of cool stuff, like more in-depth video essays and five-hour streams where I review games like this in real time. So if any of that sounds cool, please consider becoming a patron today. But I hope you enjoyed this first five review. Thanks for watching this far, and I'll see you all next week.